everyone. Today uh, I am with Tony P. Uh, very hard to pronounce his surname, to be honest. And uh, most people know him uh, as Tony P. And uh, he's the inventor of. Pretenda. Yes. And. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, almost. He is the inventor yeah. of. Let me just very, very fast introduce, then uh, Tony can introduce himself. So, Tony uh, is the inventor of Reef Routing Protocol. And of course, he contributed many uh, IETF RFCs as well. And uh, today we will discuss lots of things about Rift. And it will not definitely be just a Rift introduction video. We will touch many topics. And uh, before the session, uh, we got some questions from the network engineers. We have around 10 questions. And in the description uh, of the uh, YouTube video, you will see what exactly we will be talking. So if it's interested for you, you can uh, continue watching. So please, also with me, uh, Jeff Tanstra uh, here, and uh, you know any more, Jeff. Uh, let's let's know you, Tony, Tony. What you are doing, where you are working, and uh, we will start after that. Okay. Hey, thanks a lot, Oran. Hey, so thanks for inviting me. You have a quite influential crowd here. I see. So it will be a cool hour. Uh, uh, who I am? Well. I have been working in routing most of my career, starting at you know, the days where main, mainframes were still around. Um, I started to work on IP routing probably in the 90s. Uh, yeah, early 90s. Did a bunch of things, uh, chaired ISIS working group for a while, um, built OSPF, built PNNI for systems. Um, interesting problem, you know, coming from databases in networking, I think routing is the most interesting problem. Um, Always something new to it. Uh, right now, I'm around as distinguished engineer for Juniper, and I work on all kind of uh, crazy ideas. You know, so I'm sharing beer as well. You know, we're pushing a couple of innovative technologies, and Drift is something that struck my attention in a wider scope. You know, so there's a perception it's a, a large-scale data center protocol. Um, if that will be the only problem, I don't think it would justify to go you know, through big lengths to um, introduce a paradigm shift. But I'm seeing that uh, IP fabrics, in a sense, uh, are, will be become as ubiquitous as Ethernet switching. Right? Uh, so applied in lots of scenarios, not only data center fabrics. And um, since we start to learn uh, how to build proper telephony networks, because all this closed stuff has been pretty much done in the 50s in the Bell, in Bell Labs era, right? And the structures are becoming much more regular. And there is a reason to it, which we can also talk about. And I think such a paradigm shift brings a lot of value. And actually, I see, you know, response that justifies to do the work, of course, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> yeah, so that's roughly about me. Yeah, let's go. Jeff, are you there? So for the audience, can you just... I'm here. Yeah, please, can you introduce again yourself? Jeff so Jeff, uh, we already talked a number of times, uh, known Tony for a long time. I think I would be convincing factor for him to come from Queensland back to Silicon Valley. And I'm proud of that he's doing writing now. He's doing writing. Okay, cool. Awesome. So we will be talking 10 uh, discussion points we have. So uh, let's start with the first one. Let's understand. Of course, this is not a Rift introduction entire one hour no but uh, at least for a couple minutes it's especially we need to talk in my opinion for the larger audience we need to talk uh, briefly about rift so first question can you briefly describe what exactly rift is doing okay tony um so i think i'll answer it more along the lines of what problem is rift solving right and uh, the doing is basically solving the problem and um uh, what I'm seeing is that um, uh, networking is moving towards, um, uh, I would describe this as a regular form factor. And what I mean by that is that uh, uh, we are starting to build structure which are easy to consume. So if you want a lot of bandwidth, until now you needed you know, network engineers and specialized solutions, a lot of configuration, this kind of stuff. Whereas if you look at things like CPU, servers, memory, those are all form factors that are very consumed at a large scale. Right. 
And IP Fabrics is nothing else, in my opinion, than basically bringing up a regular form factor where you can consume a lot of bandwidth very cheaply. Let's say it's a corporation without high level of sophistication, right? And that's a problem worth tackling because the traditional protocols, routing protocols, have been built for irregular, fairly sparse meshes, right? And they put the problem exceedingly well, no discussion. Um, but this kind of problem, if you think uh, as an analogy about where leveling on solid state disks, it's a hugely complex thing, but you know nothing about it and you don't tune it, right? So why can't we consume bandwidth like that? And when we build the structures regularly enough, which are claw, there's a lot of math behind why claw is the best way to actually um, connect a lot of crossbars. Because each box is basically a crossbar. We're back to telephony switching. And the claw, there was a lot of thinking done about banning networks in the 50s, about the economics and blocking and so on. And that's why the claw comes again. And this map is very hard to defeat. So having said that, you ask yourself, okay, what, what does it mean I can consume it easily? That basically means simplicity. That basically means zero OPEX. Standardized APIs is something that you can stick together like Lego blocks and just comes up and works, okay, even if parts fail. Think about where leveling again. You don't even know how many sectors on your solid state flash failed, right? Magically, this stuff just works. So Rift is addressing precisely that problem. So it is very... ZTP center, right? A plug and play thing like an Ethernet switching, although it's doing proper IP routing. The other problem that you want to such a substrate, and I'm talking with very high level, you know, what will make such a substrate consumable is you need sub second favor, right? Um, you can't have this thing being unavailable for a long time. So, Rift is centering. Um, around the concept of, of building a protocol that will give you sub-second failure on single failures, right? Double failures are very, very difficult. They're out of scope of this discussion. And I attempted to achieve this property without FRR and LFA and TILFA, which all makes hardware very expensive because we are limited by, 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 by the chipsets, right? What we really can only rely on is long as prefix match. That is a commodity. And BFD is coming. And everything else is really, really difficult and becomes really, really expensive. If you talk about an underlay, it should be really, really cheap. If bandwidth should be provisioned very quickly, very cheaply, very reliably. But not reliably in the sense of single box being reliable. But just like the big cloud providers were pushing, you want to basically scale horizontally to get uh, reliability. And what is coming as well, I guess driving Rift, is that routing in these IP fabrics will go much, much larger scale, I think. And that will be not only driven by the simplicity and how, how quickly you can consume it. Just look at the, the amount of RAM you're consuming with solid state disk. It went exponential. And the bandwidth to an extent, but much flatter because it's so hard to consume. So once we start to first consume this bandwidth in much higher, in much higher volumes, and we will, I mean, that's a different discussion, right? Um, I think also the routing on the host is happening. And if you start to look what happens when you start routing on the servers, and we can talk about why it makes a lot of sense, right? So the answer is not all routing doesn't scale. No, our job is to make routing scale to put the servers in. All of a sudden, lots of problems you are fighting when you're building fabric and you're keeping this artificial leaf level, which is dumb, single hold, will go away. Now, if you try to attack that problem, you are talking 40x, right, size, like take a tour, take 40 servers. All of a sudden, your routing size will 40x. That is not an easy problem to tackle. And with traditional protocols, um, it's arguably very difficult to do well, okay? Whereas Rift is from the first principle already tackling this problem. But again, that, that precondition is a paradigm shift. So in course words, um, it's a routing solution for regular structures where you do IP routing that has zero OPEX. And it will give you, you can think in different words about it, uh, in the sense that it gives you a zero OPEX approximation of what the big guys are doing with arguably very high OPEX, which they can afford, 
right? Because of their, the scale they're running at, of building an IP fab. So you switch on Rift, and what you get is something that has a lot of properties of what the large guys are doing with smart things, right? But without actually understanding what's under the hood and why should you care ultimately? Just again, just like you don't care how the solid state where leveling works, right? So, um... Lots of us, actually, myself as well, we are not coming from the server system background. So maybe it will be even uh, better if you can give some analogy from the another routing protocols, any of them. Uh, for, for my understanding, also, it, it would be easier. But what so far I am uh, thinking that, OK, it's a very simple solution because uh, uh, you said plug and play almost. So it reduces, of course, OPEX in this case. We will compare with the other protocols anyway. We will start, uh, we will talk about that. But uh, simplicity and OPEX reduction uh, are main factors. Of course, uh, there, there will be other things like uh, when IGPs uh, are used in the data centers, the flooding issues, etc. We will be touching those, those as well. And unique characteristics of Rift, uh, which I am aware, for example, um, in uh, RFC 1918, Classically, it's said that uh, between the access uh, devices, when you have the shortcut, short uh, cut links, or in fact, uh, shouldn't be let that link. If that link happens in case of some failures, we will see black holes, etc. But uh, Rift is solving those kind of things. We will talk. Let's move on yeah, to yeah. second question because I, I cannot wait to discuss the, especially the comparison between the other stuff. Second thing. Um, very basic maybe, but just, just let's uh, highlight that. Is essential goal of Rift advertising uh, servers, server subnets in the network, is it? Well, so again, um, I, I suggest to wider scope that the point of Rift is that servers should basically become fully involved in routing. They become a part of the IP fabric. And that is already happening. And that is driven, so the trend was kind of fairly, when, when you were to look, I think it was fairly obvious it's happening about three years ago and it's now slowly starting to gain traction. And there is a bunch of economic drivers as well as technological drivers. So the economic driver is that the server needs are getting really powerful and really cheap. So you can get very good server silicon now for a very low price from the vendors I won't mention, which is, uh, as you know, uh, double fine, has 32 cores, right on the NIC, and it's very easy to consume. Uh, why that's happening is because I don't think the routing to the host is kind of a driver, it's kind of a natural extension when you try to address the problems there. there. One of the problems is that if you have a server to the Tor, something that is not part of a fabric, you have a security area, right? Let me expand a bit on what Tony is saying. Uh... So Kubernetes is on the block, right? So suddenly you need to route much larger blocks and they're really dynamic because, you know, if you just deploy bare metal server, you've got single IP address. You deploy a bunch of VMs, they might migrate, but still they're reasonably there, right? So yeah. they're not yeah. moving yeah. all the time. With containers, pods are completely ephemeral. They come and go. This is one side. Another side, and this is the most popular topic in the Silicon Valley startup, at least in networking start. It's really smart mix. If you look at fungible, if you look at all startups who have kind of raised more than hundred million dollars this year in networking, those are all smart mix. So what they do, they route their networking devices. So we see networking on this house becoming the networking. So all of complexity yeah. is slowly moving to the server. Intelligent well, edges. So more aspects there, right? I mean, you ask, so there the answer. But the moment you start to multi-home servers, a lot of problems with moving services around when you, for example, upgrade TORS and you have TORS failures go away, right? So multi-homing is a cool thing. Now, why don't you multi-home servers? Well, because then you have to do the routing decision, which doesn't scale with you know what we have as routing today. And if you think farther about the stuff, uh, even if you have single home, you will start to originate a lot of tunneling for the overlays. So you have to route between the tunnels, right? So already three, so that is all the wider scope. Already three years ago, I started to push in Juniper, among probably many people, to deliver actually a containerized routing stack, which is not a VM, 
right? So Juniper offers us a product, a 50 megabyte image, which is containerized Junos. So you get basically the whole Juno CLI plus the whole routing, but the whole underlying infrastructure underneath that is Linux. So we do native Linux routing with Junos on top. And of course, you can integrate Rift with that stuff. And now all of a sudden you understand in a very small footprint, you get underlay and overlay routing on the server. But there are limitations if you think about the server need. You don't want the server need you know, a million routes. That is not neither efficient nor intelligent. So you need a routing solution that keeps the routing table on the server, on the NIC, relatively small. Yeah, but uh, let's, let's clarify one thing actually here, that uh, servers don't have to join to uh, routing neighborship. So they don't have to run routing. But we are saying, okay, if they aren't, are running routing, is it true here? Because Rift is not... Uh, pushing, it's not saying it's mandatory to run routing uh, on the host itself, right? No, it's not mandatory, but it scales to this size, so you can do it without any problems with Rift, and that will give you certain benefits. Um, yes, of course, you can just put the default route on the NIC and say, I'm done. If the, if, if, if the server is single home, but again, don't forget the overlay starts to run tunnels. So even if it's single home, you have a lot of overlay tunnels you want to route. But let's assume you have one tunnel and one in single home. Well, then routing doesn't benefit you anything. You can just as well put the static default route. The moment you start to multi-home and make routing decisions and you just put the default route there, you will black hole. Yeah, right. right? But remember, so, you, don't, you don't see failures that happen at next, next hop. So if it's just a default, you'll be happily launch and across others available that are not. Yeah, you but need to if, be able to take more intelligent decisions. Yeah, if you, if there you is know. a routing there, even next next stop failures will be signaled to the host. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question. Now we are slowly warming up, but so far, if I would just uh, briefly say two points we talked: simplicity uh, comes with the Rift. Why simple? Uh, Yes, we didn't touch many many things actually about Rift, so you will watch another maybe Rift introduction videos. So uh, when the nodes physically, when we connect them together, we have, we, you are calling them level, right? Level 0, level 1, level 2, so they find their yeah, place. We were calling, yeah, we were calling things differently and then it, enough confusion was caused that we decided to call it things levels. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Nodes actually, they can understand exactly they are which level and their functionality based on their level. So uh, this brings the uh, lots of simplicity. Simplicity brings uh, OPEX reduction. So we talked about that. And second point, we talked, yes, uh, Rift, or actually when we extend the intelligence to the edges, we talked this concept in a couple other videos actually, uh, pushing the intelligence to the edge so, uh, and if you do that in the data center, uh, which means running routing, even maybe it could be MPLS or something, intelligence. So to the edge, now scale factor suddenly uh, grows and not every protocol can han handle this scalability. So second uh, point then, we are talking Rift and scale uh, for the scalability, what it brings. Now, third point, Many large, this is question, so we will start uh, discussing about yeah. it. Many large scale data centers already deployed BGP in their network. Why they should deploy or they should migrate uh, Rift? So now this is a uh, starting BGP in MSDC, massive scale data center deployment, BGP in those uh, data centers. And why Rift would we migrate? Would, be, uh, would there be any case, especially compared to Rift, uh, BGP? Um, yeah, I mean, so I'm not telling anyone they have to migrate, right? And don't forget that the large, um, uh, I mean, we as a company work with all of that, right? And uh, widely deployed in all kinds of scenarios across the stuff. So, you know, we have good insight what they're doing and why they're doing things. Uh, the, the five, six, ten largest um, uh, substrates, I would call them, right, on the planet, they're running their own economics, right? So. It is lots of the solution 
the way they solve things, they can afford to solve things that way. And because they were running first, they took whatever worked and could be done, right? Um, so I'm not saying that I'm looking to like roll over all the large data centers, you know, of all the big guys towards Rift. It may happen over a very long period of time. But frankly, you know, they solved it with specialized OPEX solutions. And uh, they chose underneath a certain solution, and, and arguably they could even install static routes, right? And, and that's fine thing for them. But behind them come thousands and thousands of people who are facing the same problem, right? And we see the regular, the, the closed structure, the IP fabrics being now used in, I see them in Metro, being used a lot with open to cable networks, who look at a lot of these structures, just because they're so simple to provision and understand, right? Uh, and those people will be arguably often misguided of trying to build the same OPEX complexity. Those things need very long time to build, are mostly proprietary, um, and they they need a very large economics of scale. I, right? I, I cannot so I not, cannot get the point here. Uh, what is proprietary here? Uh, and you said also static routing, it could be even solved with that. So the I, I well, so, so think, for example, with BGP, if you look, you know, how it, it is described how to run this BGP. Uh -huh. Just go look at the configuration sizes of those things mm -hmm. to operate BGP that way. Or just look at, at problems like taking a node out of production where you have to drain it. If you have an OPEX run, uh, that you built on top, your provisioning system, operational system that does all the stuff, or react to failures or gather somehow by proprietary means, for example, the topology, because if you run EBGT, you don't have the full topology of the fabric, yeah. then you're fine. But if you don't, you need that stuff, or you have to put more things in like BGPLS. And all of a sudden, those are all complicated pieces of machinery that you need a lot of tooling on top, right? And that is OPEX. Complexity generates OPEX. Now I, I think right? I get your so, point. Now I think uh, you are you saying this. So uh, another discussion point will be BGP plus SPF. So SPF how it brings the topology information in BGP. So with the BGP LS as well. Yeah. So but um, what I understand. So you said proprietary version because the people who deployed BGP earlier. So they modified the code as well. So they have their own, let's say, version of BGP, lots of TVX they have, so on and so forth. I, th I think you are talking about that. So at the end, you are... You need, you need a pretty serious system on top that is configuring and, and managing the whole thing. Just think about the fact that BGP doesn't have any auto-discovery, right? So you need to let configure me... and provision all that. Let and me... it has all to match. And if you break, you have to... Uh, I'm breaking up. No, 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 no. Just uh, there. When you said BGP, I can, I can hear you. No problem. But maybe also yeah. we can remember there is two two drafts. Uh, I remember. Maybe they are not uh, RFC yet for the BGP. I need to. Yeah, we will. As I told, we will deep dive. So whatever I remember, whatever you guys also remember, let's just uh, dig in because this point is important. BGP, when we compare them, and um, if we say, okay, manual operation required, like remote AS def definition and all those stuff, there was two new work in IETF. One of them actually is suggesting to find uh, the BGP neighbor relationship and even maybe automatically configuring them, uh, running LLDP. And another draft is was talking oh. how we can maybe um, change the way of BGP uh, agency maintenance uh, running UDP once every night, so like multicast similar to IGPs. So those yeah. things may be... Well, let, me, let me address this point. Sure. Actually, it's pretty close to what I'm doing now. So about a month ago, we've organized BGP Auto Discovery Working Group, not working group, design team in IDR, which is IDF Working Group that's in charge of BGP. And we've got like six competing drafts one of them is mine, <laughs> or mine casters. So we are trying to find the best solution to provide BGP auto discovery. So you put two BGP speaking devices on the wire, and somehow they auto discover each other and decide what they do. So this is an ongoing work. I'll keep you updated on this. Okay. With yes, regards okay. to with regards to previous work, actually, it was mostly published by Peter Lapokov, who is also the author of BGP in large DC. When he was with Microsoft, they built a controller that had a BGP speaker and could listen to BGP updates and do some intelligent stuff. 
use third party next hop to change the routing. So this is exactly what Tony is alluding for. On itself, BGP just gives you reachability distribution. If you want to do anything more than that, you need to have right infrastructure, including backend database, decision logic to enhance it. Including LLDP. Yeah. So, yeah. LLDP not, not, not necessarily, but yes, you might actually. So look, it's software, and of course, everything can be modified and more drafts written and claim it solves the problem, right? And if people are willing to work for that, and they will become the preferred solution and so on, you know, like, yes, it will mod closer and closer to what to simplify things. But right now, it's simply not in the state it is, right? The second observation in terms of like, is it better or whatever? I mean, I'm not here to um, display solutions if people are super happy with them and what works for them. But one of the things that we give a lot of consideration is how would you brownfield yeah. Because you don't, if you don't have a brownfield strategy, it's, it's, it's a very uphill battle. So Rift is actually, even in existing fabric, whatever you're running, very easy to brownfield. What you do at the top of the fabric or this little piece that you carve out and you run, let's say, a pod, right? You basically redistribute BGP default into Rift and you redistribute Rift straight up into BGP and you're done. It's actually one no. Okay, but for this one, there might be many other considerations, such as uh, are those devices supporting Rift? Do we need hardware change? Actually, one of the uh, question will be that. Another yeah. thing will even uh, let's say devices start supporting it, will we have? Ah, you said default route redistribution, so it shouldn't be an issue for the resource consumption. Otherwise, if we are talking full table, if we would keep full table anyway on the top of rack, which we, sh we shouldn't maybe. So uh, I think scalability, so resource consumption point of view, shouldn't be an issue when you especially redistribute no, it, the it looks like Rift. Just instead of Rift top of the fabric advertising uh, default route, you just take and redistribute BGP as the default into Rift. Yeah. And from Rift, you redistribute what you want into BGP. You either take the full routing table, which the top of the fabric has, because there's no other solution, or otherwise you take some aggregates, generate aggregates. And it's kind of traditional redistribution with policy nodes kind of problem, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here's a bunch of red what you want to do with it and put it into BGP. So, so I, I, I think you should take discussion to how Rift is different rather than how Rift is similar. Because if you just need to distribute, I know, 10K prefixes, you could use Rift, right? Uh, let's talk about what Rift can do that no other protocol can do. Exactly. I think it would be much more interesting discussion. Exactly. Tony. Okay, we're swaying now in a different direction. Uh, uh, by the way, just let me say something. Yeah. Uh, because that point, yeah, actually, I don't see as a question that point, but that's excellent uh, discussion, uh, which now Jeff is driving. Uh, can we say very unique <laughs> yeah, things just... Don't watch it, because otherwise it will be Jeff's show. You know how he works, right? <laughs> Yes, okay. yes. So, what exactly is Rift uniquely bringing to the table? So, what other protocols cannot solve? Um, uh, okay, good. So, it will be become more like a marketing pitch, right? And again, it will go back to the problems that I solve. So, it is extremely ZTP centered. So, you don't need any addressing on the fabric except, except V6 link local. And it will route V4 for you as well. Now think about the amount of simplification that brings for you, right? The second thing that you get that is hard to, do, to get with other protocols used for this purpose is that uh, at the top of the fabric, you get the complete uh, topology. So if you run an IGP, you will get that stuff, right? But with VGP, it's, it's, a, it's a very non-obvious problem to solve. So you can hook up at the top of the fabric and you see a complete fabric with everything. Right, so that's a nice thing to have. Um, it will scale all the way down to the servers because it just has the default route and it only disaggregates one level, which fixes all the breakages on single plane fabric. Multi plane fabric, we addressed that stuff as well, but arguably 95% of customers I'm seeing will never see a multi plane fabric because it's simply not a problem they will ever get to, right? Not exactly uh, in the so data center, yeah. Maybe in the wider network, we can, we can see more, but in the data center, exactly. Agree. Uh, 
yes, so uh, I see very little of that. It's really not even 5%, right? Because arguably it's much simpler to put a relatively higher rating switch at the top of fabric and be done with it, rather than try to build multiplying fabrics, which cause all kind of interesting problems again. What you get out of red that you cannot solve otherwise, and here we go to basically the, to the first principles, is that it is loop-free. So you can do lots of stuff that traditional protocols cannot do because they bound by shortest path. So one of the things that Rift does for you is bandwidth balancing, right? So if you come from the bottom of the fabric, it will understand what is your bandwidth of the fabric towards the top, and it will load balance dynamically based on available bandwidth. Now that sounds like, well, is that a problem because fabrics are kind of symmetric, uh, unless the fat names fail. And then people really see the problem that equal distribution leads to a lot of losses. So they wonder like a coarse shifting of bandwidth uh, across the fabric. Are we talking uh, so ECMP? The, you are not talking ECMP, I think. Equal cost multipads? Uh, no, I'm not talking ECMP. I am talking actually, depending on how much bandwidth you have available on which path, you will put different amount of traffic on, on the link, right? So Rift does that automatically. Now, that is... So, and uh, let, let me interrupt you for a second. So I'm doing significant amount of consultancy. Every second day here, Guys, can I just plug into 200 gig link or 400 gig link into my fabric and have all the problems disappear? And you need to explain, if you start mixing different speeds in the same fabric, you are rather undersubscribing, so you are still at lower speed because most of your links are, or you are oversubscribing and dropping traffic on all slow links. So what Tony is saying, that Rip gives the ability to automatically signal cumulative bandwidth available up and load share and accurately traffic across the spot. So uh, we are talking Which UCMP no then, unequal cost multipad then we are talking about. Yeah, but done automatically without playing with BGP communities, with bandwidth, with the uh, DMZ community, some other stuff that are not dynamic. Rift is completely dynamic in the way it computes bandwidth available and updated near real time so as far as so i know actually three three different solutions we could have either igp with the traffic engineering like rsvp based of course uh, i am joking the second one uh, eigrp could do ucmp oh, like for that. us if I can sell that, perfect. No problem. so, so uh, it's proven you cannot do traffic engineering over ecmp fabric it's mp hard no, no, use the MP fabric I am talking. I mean, uh, 100 gig over here and 10 gig over here. So I need to do some traffic engineering. So otherwise, sh uh, shortest path al always will ch choose that 100 gig. So I need to put some traffic over 10 gig as well. So let ha lots of other protocols maybe will come into the picture. But Rift as a single protocol can solve this issue we are talking. And uh, only standard, hopefully standard, we will talk about that part. Will it be standard or not? But uh, EIGRP can do actually this one. Uh, Cisco own protocol, IGP protocol, some people know anyway. So, uh, but you need, of course, manual operation for that. And uh, you need to manually enable it, uh, blah, blah, blah. So Rift is solving this, and uh, this is a very good point, actually. D different speeds we are talking, is not ECMP, guys. So if you have Tangit, Tangit, you can do ECMP. By the way, with BGP, it is even not automatically, because with BGP, even if you have uh, same capacity and uh, let's say the upper level attributes are same, local pref, AS, pet origin, met, blah, blah, blah. So you need to manually say uh, you want to have multi pet in here. We have, we have in, in Juno's a whole page of special notes just to deal with BGP and CMP. Yeah. And, you know, we can talk L3V, EVP, and IBGP, EBGP, you know, like over mad, without mad. Like, we have a page full of knots. Right? So, this is cool. This so, is cool. cutting Tony's marketing in general, the only way to provide this functionality in BGP is by adding special community that encodes bandwidth available on outgoing links, which is static. Yeah. So, you have to configure it. And your hardware needs to support it. So, there's a lot of gotchas. In and BGP, I you think, really need the right way to do this. I think BGP DMZ bandwidth, they call it something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So oh. people try things like that on Fabric. I mean, lots of the stuff I did comes from a lot of discussion. People trying to do things with BGP and given up or failed or being unsatisfied with what our uh, you know, ultimately came out. Uh, but, you know, let's let's get to like even simpler operational stuff that Rift gives you that is hard to get with what you get out of box today. Yeah. So one of them is link miscaling. It sounds, oh, well, what's the big deal? 
it is actually a pretty serious operational problem for a lot of people. They miscable those fabrics, believe it or not, at a fairly high rate. And that leads to a lot of interesting problems, including complete meltdowns of full fabrics, right? The RIP does the link miscabling detection, and it will not form adjacency and actually um, alert you to the fact that you miscable and why this thing is miscabled. Can I? Even into an operational problem. When I'm going onto a switch and I want to see what I'm connected to, it is not trivial. Like which part of the other guy is the stuff plugged in? The RIF distributes all this information. And when you look at the, the adjacency is formed by RIF, you will see which switch are you talking to, which port on the switch is it, which routing instance of RIF are you running. So that's getting a little bit of more implementation. But for example, RIF does like instance matching. So because it's, it, when, you, when you have multiple instances of the protocol running, which, which people do, it's very easy to like mismatch the instance to each other, plug it on the same port, right? Those are operational problems. Those are problems when you talk to people, you operate your fabric, what are you hitting? Where are you losing your time, right? So it has been specifically tailored to this kind of stuff. Uh, the other things people are facing is desegregation of labs. The labs cause a lot of bandwidth asymmetry problems. So RIP is addressing the scale where you can disaggregate all the lags as IP links. And actually, it runs, if you want, BFD automatically over all those links, right? So we're looking at a really native IP fabric at the simplicity of Ethernet switching. Um, can we can we talk more? about this disaggregation of lag again? So lag link aggregation group Tony is talking about right. disaggregation of lag is that you people lag things up because otherwise it's just too much routing information for normal protocol, right? Now when you lag things up, you face two problems. One of them is that the lag key is slow in detecting stuff going down, right? Uh, normally the, the resolution of timers is within seconds. Uh, one second is even non-standard, and there is you cannot encode it. So there is otherwise on the protocol. So there are extensions. It is minimum one second as per spec with three seconds. Right, three seconds. Yeah. So all of a sudden you lack constituent failings, like three seconds, nothing happening, and then you need the protocol on top. So even if it fails, the problem is that it generates very quickly bandwidth asymmetries because it's invisible to routing. Right? If I put five, ten, ten, ten gig links, I get fifty gig. Looks like a 50 gig lift. That is cool, but what if two constituents fail? Now, I have a link which I think is 50 gig, but it's really 30 gig underneath. So I start to get magic losses that at IP level that are very hard to, you know, even to figure out where they're happening. And then there is no good option when you bring the lag down. So, okay, you have 50, you lost two. You, do you declare the whole lag down? Do you wait until you lose three, four, right? So because you're hiding this thing as L2, you start to see a lot of funky properties with, because you don't have the necessary L3 information. So to get the real proper IP substrate, you really have to explode and disaggregate all that stuff, which generates the according amount of you know, um, uh, information that you have to deal with and problems like you know, very large fan outs in terms of IP adjacencies and so on. So let's when we uh, let me actually translate what you said a little bit for the audience. Let's say we well, have you ten gig. In depth, so we're going in depth. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. But okay. some some people still might be, you know, uh, what, may want to understand, but they may not understand. So uh, let me put it in this way: if we have uh, between uh, leaf and spine, let's say ten times ten gig links. And we put them in a layer two bundle, which we call link aggregation, by the way, guys, if it would be layer three, we would call them ECMP if the same uh, capacity. So layer two, let's say, and two of them failed. And how many links remained? Eight out of uh, we had 10, two of them failed, eight remained. Now what we are seeing with the disaggregation, we need to remove those two. And we should assume now we don't have any more 100 gig total capacity, but 80 and uh, with this one and exactly if we wouldn't remove them uh, so are you saying that switch would do the hashing and still will try to push the traffic there yeah because you know it looks like a hundred gig link for all practical purposes right when you build the ip routing on top yeah what two, two, two know, things anything from l2 coming up what, what if right? i would 
I wouldn't put them in a bundle, layer two bundle, but uh, if I would run out of those 10 interfaces, if I would run layer three in, instead. Okay, instead. and you're fine. And that's what Drift is doing, right? You run L3 on every link and you run BFD on every link. Uh -huh. yes. BFD for the face failure detection we are running. Uh, otherwise, yeah, this, yeah. you said one second, three seconds. Uh, I think Jeff also defined the spec. It is, uh, is it's link, uh, link aggregations default parameter. What is that? Uh, link aggregations. One, uh, three dot AD, I think. So, no, hello, hello timer, dead timer. It defines slow timers for uh, LACP. Okay. So, but Tony is again alluding here. If you're at layer two, it doesn't actually matter how many links you have. Your layer three will still treat them as a single bundle. This is the main property of uh, either channels, right? Sure. Or aggregation group. Sure. So, this, so if you disaggregate them suddenly, you could see how much bandwidth is actually available. Exactly. Exactly. So the, the, yeah, if you summarize, then uh, out of ten, if we remove two of them, so we, the, now we have uh, eight times ten gig, let's say. So we have uh, any more again eighty gig. And uh, we will not see loss, but if we would do layer three agency, we wouldn't see this problem. That one second, three second, if we would clarify, they are uh, the timer LACP's um, hello and dead timer. Let's put in that way. And uh, Rift would allow us to, of course, uh, run BFT as well. Rift uh, extend. Do, do we need an extension for that? No, it's baked into the protocol. Okay. Of course, you can nope it, but Red will basically bring BFD when it comes up automatically. It's a both side negotiation, right? So there's a detection where the BFD is supported. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to uh, another question. By the way, we had a 10 question and almost 40 minutes. Probably we, we might have second Rift discussion. I, I can maybe I can get some promise from Tony. Well, more than happy. I mean, Excellent. there's there's good amount of work done there, and there's not good amount of detail and tons of discussion with people that had operational problems. On yeah, this probably yeah. today it would be uh, because otherwise I wouldn't. Uh, we we had to spend maybe just two three minutes, uh, five minutes maximum per question, but now we are discussing and touching nice points. Now we, we have two more questions then so we can go into some details. Uh, is there any uh, real real life deployment with Rift? Of course, uh, we don't have to give any customer name. Uh, I can understand NDA. So, but uh, what's happening there? Is there any real life deployment? Any plant? Anything? Yeah. So let me uh, answer that in uh, a nice, obtuse way. So Rift is available uh, on Juniper since end of last year. Right. So it's there. Uh, you can run it on um, any device running Junos. It is uh, silicon agnostic, it runs on any silicon, and that's an interesting discussion, right? Like, is Rift preconditioning proprietary silicon? And the answer is no. That was like the first premise, right? Um, because otherwise the adoption will be really slow, and I'm not a big believer, you know, that goes to economics again. So it's available, and of course we engage on many fronts, you know, we're more than happy that when you talk to us, and then we get to run the stuff. Okay, uh, actually, uh, it very fast question, so maybe we, it can lead us to another questions. Maybe a couple more. When Rift RFC will come? Then this is another thing. So is it an informational or standard track? What what it what it will be? Yeah. So yes, my you. domain, it's a standard track RFC, and uh, it defines protocol behavior. It's very well. It's very well written, mostly by Tony. Okay, but uh, <laughs> and. Uh, so, uh, written by very smart people like Pascal. I mean, I, I, I mean, like, I would say about a third of the stuff by now has been written by very smart other people. But so, we, 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 don't, we don't, we don't have any, we don't have yet the uh, Rift RFC, right? Not no, yet. it's in process, but we are very close. We are very close. So we are in the last stages of review, and right now I'm having tons of people, especially operational people, um, reviewing it for readability. So like it should be read smoother. Uh, we're pretty much done. I think we're on the last couple of subsections. I hope for this IP it will have like a fully reviewed one. When so technically proof, but sorry. Sorry, uh, please continue. I will say other thing. So there's another thing to that normally open source implementation for read. So there's implementation by uh, Bruno Reisman, 
and uh, it's in constant sync with Juniper implementation latest spec. So Bruno is, has created testing framework that continuously validate the functionality. Mm -hmm. So if you want to see what protocol is doing, there's Python code. It's really beautifully documented. It works really well. I can share a GitHub link to where it is. So you could go look into the code and see what protocol really does. Besides yeah, RFC. So the premise from day one was that it will be a completely open standard, right? I mean, with Juniper, we have a long tradition of that, but I'm also a big believer in that, right? Our right, for example, EIGRP has proven a tremendous success. Never document that proprietary, let I mean, use. One of the probably large, largest deployed bases on the planet, right? But I chose not to go this route. So it has been open standard from day one. Uh, it's very well specified out. I'm not a, believe, a big believer in obfuscated drafts. You know, I grew up under people like John Moy, who were, you know, very meticulous mathematicians. Um, there is an open source implementation, so we always run interoperability so meticulously without talking to each other. And the other premise of RIP was that it has to run on any kind of silicon, right? Basically, the only thing that it preconditions long is prefix match. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that uh, uh, you silicon have, has to understand. Everything else is completely optional. So when new RFC is published, generally I see Jeff is announcing it on uh, his LinkedIn profile. Jeff, let me do uh, this time myself. When Rift is uh, when Rift becomes RFC, let me publish. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll, I'll let you know the first. Okay. Excellent. So another. Uh, so, so, sorry, I think we we didn't talk about the encoding part because we've got number of questions previous about. Uh, webcast about why should we do ISS versus OSPF and why one protocol is more flexible than another. I think it's very important point that has to do with encoding and the way we do it. Please go ahead. Um, I, I think it's a little bit of the guts of the protocol. I don't think people are necessarily interested how this stuff is implemented and built in details. Maybe no, but people are interested in agility and time it takes to adjust or innovate on top of protocol. Or, or some, so, some maybe so, extra data yeah. if we can carry as metadata, those kind of things, uh, what we can do with it. Uh, yes, well, okay, so the metadata is a different discussion, right? So uh, because of the operational considerations, um, I put a key value uh, store into the protocol, which sounds weird, unless you talk to the operational guys and understand the problems they're fighting. And I give you just two use cases, right? How a key value store can be used. Because I'm, I'm more interested in operational discussion. Agility, yeah, we can turn the protocol and test it very quickly. And the whole thing is Juno's uh, package, so you can install it without waiting for Juno's releases, because that's how data center people move. But that's kind of, you know, the, 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 the sausage making. Let's talk about whether the sausage tastes well enough to work bothering buy one and cook it, right? Uh, so the key value store, I just give you two use cases. So one use case was, and that kind of bold me slightly over. People are very interested in routing security on fabrics. And I know it's a known issue, right? It is your own substrate. Like, why would you bother? There, there's a good amount of interest, but people didn't explain to me precisely why, whether this protocol offers security. And the protocol is top of the line routing security built in, right? Uh, so we do the whole thing down to the point where you can actually prevent miscabling from the wrong port to the wrong port onto switches, which I consider a non-issue. Like, well, you just want to make sure that two guys are plugged together the right way. But people care about which port we go see. And then an issue came up where people said, well, okay, so I'm having the keys on my fabric, and now my fabric becomes compromised. What will I do? I have tons of pre-configured servers or whatever tours that I want to plug in into this stuff, but now I know the key is compromised. So the key value store allows you to inject the key at the top of the fabric and it percolates with the whole fabric down to roll over the key, which allows you to roll over everybody who is right now on the fabric to a new key. So everyone with the old key will not be able to plug in anymore. Let me just interrupt and let me give an analogy for those who know Cisco very well. 
So it's uh, very similar to what GetVPN is doing, guys. So centralized key servers and group members, just remember those key servers pushing the keys down. And then if it's compromised somehow, uh, even without compromising uh, for periodically, you can refresh the key for sure. So what exactly Rift is doing without introducing another yet another protocol. Okay. Yeah, so it's built into the protocol. It's not the like afterthought. Yeah. It's inherent to protocol to be able to receive this information yeah. and very fast and very reliable. People will immediately After understand this get VPN point, by the way. That's why I wanted to say. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. super analogy. I mean, I'm, uh, I, I don't claim pieces of the stuff have been done before, right? I mean, people struggle with those problems and they have all kinds of, of, of solutions already where they try to address somewhat better. So the other use case that always comes up is that you say, why stretch routing to the server? So people like it for a lot of non-obvious reasons sometimes. Some, uh, one of them is that they want to catalog the servers. What is the IPR binding, right? Because the Tor are throwing out some IP address to a server and they have the R, and now how do you get it? So they have this special OPEX solution that go to the servers, pick the stuff up, or, or somehow scrap it off the Tors, and what always happens is that the routing is out of sync with those things. Because you, you're trying to coalesce a database going over routing while the routing may or may not work, so your database is out of sync, routing goes faster than the database, go figure. So Rift allows you to put your IPR binding in a key value store and push it all the way to the top of the fabric. So at the top of the fabric, you have real time, basically inventory of your IPR assignments. I mean, is that somehow super sophisticated? No, but it's one of those pieces like, how do you run it with the lowest possible OPEX, right? Without building sophisticated stuff, third party tools. Another use case is ZTP in the sense that the underlay came up, right? So fine, now what? So Rift can also from the top of the fabric push the address of the ZTP server you go to to, to install the overlay, right? Which is like ZTP is really bootstrapping thing, underlay, overlay, one after the next, right? And um, this responds well when people are really caring about simplicity, right? When they live through this tortures, different tools and problems and dragging stuff forward and growing you know, Python scripts in-house and then people leave and someone else comes and writes a playbook and then the playbook gets out of date and so on. So this thing that I could find that operationally really simplifies the life of someone running an IT fabric, that's what is baked into Reddit. That's really the, you know, the, the message. And um, will people be out of jobs? Because then they're concerned, right? Like, oh, well, okay, the stuff runs itself. No, there's a million more interesting problems to solve that, you know, people need time for, like, for example, overlay, right? Rift doesn't touch overlay because overlay is really a service access point provisioning. And that always differs because everyone offers different services. And that's where the money is, right? So as an organization, that's where you really should be putting in your time to build the best services rather than solve the underlay problem over and over again, like reinventing your own harness. Which but that's, that's my view of the world. Which bring actually last question less less than uh, answer because it's related with the overlay which you just started. Which overlay will be the most common use case with Rift? I well, so just personally, I don't care. Yeah. It will run any right. Uh, what I see most demand for right now is EVPN. EVPN. As discussed in previous, me again we see it's mostly driven by the slum. EVPN is the control plane. It addresses pretty much all the use cases. There are a bunch of new stuff coming in EVPN as well that supports new variant VO3 tunnels. So Junif is one of them, for example. We just need stable underlay to build value as a service center. So when, Co when, when Jeff says that, let me also uh, clarify a little bit this one because uh, not everybody may, maybe you didn't watch the previous uh, sessions. Please do, by the way, we, we recorded two videos with Jeff and they were excellent. So Rift is the routing protocol to bring the underlay fabric. It's a, like a transport, yeah. not for the service, underlay. Now, on top yeah. of that underlay, when we want to have service, 
analogy would be like MPLS L3 VPN, Compella Martini, Martini Layer 2 VPN. So we have transport and on top of that service, right? So here in the data center, Rift bringing the infrastructure together. And on top of that, when you want to have fabric, what Jeff said, uh, eVPN and VXLAN driving in the previous discussion also, we talked about that. VXLAN is the data plane of the overlay and eVPN is the control plane of the overlay. But Rift, yeah. why Rift is there? For transport, actually bringing every everything together at the underlay level. So just wanted to clarify for those because we are understanding each other. We don't, I don't assume everybody should understand exactly what exactly we talked so far. Sometimes I am doing this clarification. Sorry. Yeah. And I mean, there are a few people who are not running overlays, you know, if they run a pure V6 fabric and have a huge address block, that's one architecture. Rift, uh, some people are pursuing an idea where they run a stack of Rifts. That's why I was talking about multi instances, because Rift is lightweight when you go low in the fabric, right? You, you really just push the four outs down. So people are toying with the idea of running a stack of Rifts and they're trying that. Mm, would I encourage that? Well, I'm kind of, kind of agnostic. But what I see most demand for, if you ask me, is very clearly a VPN at this point in time. Okay, yes. now, uh, now I finished the questions coming from the students. A couple of things so for my understanding as well. What I know, Rift uh, towards the northbound, we, are, we have link state behavior, so we have topology information, uh, and all the, um, net, the networks view at the uh, top layer. So at the, let's say spine, super spine, whatever we have. Yeah. And uh, southbound, we have distance vector behavior. So at the very um, bottom device, we have just default route. So they don't know Correct. the college information as well. Now we have levels as well. Levels are starting from level zero, one, two, three. So, and we mm -hmm. talked about this uh, running so route. Yeah. Correct. So that's something that surprises you, and that's the evolution we went through. We started from zero at the bottom. And then we discovered, to our surprise, that people are building fabrics on unequal heights. And it's actually quite common. Depending on the type of pots that you have, you may have different number of levels. So if you start at zero everywhere, you cannot argue at the top where you are. The rift is actually starting from the top of the fabric, which is the fixed level, pick a number, 24, and then it percolates down. And the leaves are normally not level zero. You can make them level zero for a specific purpose, but the levels get distributed downwards into the fabric because it's the only solution that works. Uh, so it has to do with relative location of a device in the fabric. What if, if I am running routing, so rift on the host level, is host yeah. becoming level zero then? You can set it to prevent it from having more leaves, but no, normally you don't have to set anything. It will pick up just one, one, one level lower than the guy above. Okay. Uh, remember, number is relative. What you need to ensure is that as you go down, number decreases, right? Yeah, so number you decreases. know where you're relative. So if your spine, your super spine is going to be high, your leaf is going to be lower. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, That's all you need, really. And, and it is used in couple couple places in Rift. But, uh, for example, for loop prevention, also you are using it, right? Ma when you do miss cabling, for example, levels come into the picture to uh, resolve yeah. the issue. Yes. So loop freeness is much deeper baked into the protocol. Uh, look, Rift is only possible because it takes advantage of one assumption that we have directionality, okay. right? And that's a limitation that gives you a huge amount of benefits that you cannot get otherwise. Okay. And one of them is barely free routing because I understand when I'm going up and when I'm going down. So I'm going up until I turn around and I'm going down, which gives you barely free routing. Barely free routing has fantastic properties. It's loop free by definition. You don't run zigzags, right? We, we can live on horizontal links. Rift also solves horizontal links, but that's kind of a corner case which has other implications. Um, but the loop freeness is a much deeper baked in paradigm into the protocol. So for example, Rift does not precondition ZTP. You can define all your levels manually. It will work just fine, right? Mm -hmm. But the fact that you have the directionality on the fabric, 
that allows you to saturate all the paths independent of how long or short they are. And that's what allows easily things like bandwidth balancing. So I got because your I point. Can... But if you will put in a simpler words, like for example, when I say BGP, if it's eBGP, loop, uh, loop prevention, Definition is very easy for me. If I see my own autonomous system number in the ESPET, I will not accept that. So I, I guarantee that to Prinas. Uh, I wish it was that simple. So I'm kind of working around this kind of problems every day. I still look every second week because people say, hey, now I need to leak route through firewall back. So you go, you say, oh, allow my own ASIN. Yeah, allow and ASIN. Then you go, oh, exactly. why should they use different ASIN? You... Let me use another allocation scheme because I want to use a sense in the trace. So suddenly another spine will accept route from the first spine and happily send it down. So you get zigzags. Uh, it, so this property of a protocol is often kind of, if not misunderstood, downplaying. You, you are right. It's a huge right. thing, and I see issues with it on weekly basis. You are right. So with, it, in proper configuration of BGP mostly. In even, uh, yeah. It, but very simple uh, definition I was saying. Otherwise, if the, let's say if you are doing AS, Override or LOASN, you are just uh, accepting the, that routing loop might happen, but there are use cases like MPLS VPN, maybe same uh, autonomous system number everywhere and layer 3 VPN, let's say. So you need to do that, but then you need to deal with the BGP site of origin, so on and so forth. But the idea is B with the BGP, at least I have that. Now I was trying to figure it out with Rift loop prevention in a simpler way. Okay, if I am Rift advertising the prefixes to, let's say, spine. So, will I get back those prefixes from spine back to another leaf? No, no, never. Because think, you just plot no. So the topology aggregates top. Oh, okay. You, you don't, right? So you don't have the problem of something like an IGP, which will be flat through a million different paths and try to figure out all the versions and so on. So Rift does plotting, and we can talk about flood reduction, which is a sub, sub, sub problem of why it's really hard to run an IGP in the data center normally. Um, but you flood the topology up. The guy at the top basically computes, think about an SPF tree, but it's not really SPF, all possible paths sum, right? Whereas you, when you're somewhere low, you only view of the topology is things below you and one level above, but you really just see a link in the different route. And you just push northbound when you forward, you either have a longest prefix match which goes south, at which point in time the traffic turns, and then everybody has an according route. So it goes south until its destination. And if you don't have the prefix, then you just push any links northbound on the default. Got the point. Right? But so the first yeah, so, uh... more specific most more specific turns it southbound and it never turns around northbound again. And if you don't have a solution to push it southbound, you just push it north because, and the top of the fabric needs the full topology because that's where the buck stops. Yeah. Somebody has to turn it around. Otherwise you basically discard. Yeah. So I have a proposal for the next online meeting. Yeah. Uh, this one uh, is kind of, it's not introduction to Rift, but reasonably high level. We didn't discuss really the value of uh, uh, loop free routing, which is very interesting discussion itself. We didn't discuss how Rift does disaggregation, and again, it's unique to the protocol. So I would think that we would need to actually show a picture to make it more visual and go specifically over these properties that are absolutely unique to the protocol and actually enrich your knowledge about how routing works, whether it's BGP Rift or anything else, because it's fundamental for protocol to be different and better yeah actually uh, for the automatic segregation which is very unique to this protocol and in the uh, 7938 it's clearly sh says it should be avoided basically uh, but because because obvious reasons but we need to show the topology for that i agree with you and even for this directionality and loop avoidance uh, inherent loop avoidance uh, mechanism of rift I think we need maybe topology for the next time. Uh, we can just very simple uh, couple topology we can show and explain those unique characteristics. By the way, we have uh, normally five more questions, but unfortunately, uh, this is probably enough already lengthy. So, but uh, it was really good discussion. Uh, we highlighted why we should have it, 
if we would very fast, like 30 seconds, we would summarize. We talked about the scalability, we talked about the simplicity of RIFT and some still unique characteristics like uh, ZTP, BFT supports and uh, other stuff. Uh, we talked about one one thing. In fact, it was very interesting, which is uh, UCMP support automatically it's done. Uh, so unequivocal smart path, you, ha you have uh, different speed links and uh, basically you don't just attack to the shortest path, but you are able to use both of those paths. Uh, and another thing we discussed, if we would just uh, remember, we might have layer two link aggregation and uh, when we lose some of those physical links, uh, you would be black all the traffic uh, because of hashing on the devices. But uh, with Rift, you also disaggregate those failed links and you have exactly what uh, capacity you have. You will um, balance the traffic to those unfailed remaining links, let's say. We talked about actually many, many things, but still we have other questions about Rift, that's why. I am proposing and getting the promise from Tony and Jeff for the next Reef talk. And what do you guys want to say? Yeah, let's uh, slowly finish this one. So I'm looking forward to next discussion and this Tony will share one of these beautiful pictures he's making for the protocol. Okay. And we'll go through it and explain in kind of more, I would say, easier to digest more visual, more intuitive ways why why we do Rift what we do and how it's really different and how did we come to this decision to make it be a particular way. It's very important point for you to understand to really appreciate the protocol. The, There's one question. Yeah, let's uh, get that. Online. Go ahead, go ahead. Hi, uh, sorry, a quick question. Uh, is there any uh, notification for uh, on uh, over day from Rift? For example, if Rift detects any PFD, so it uh, notify overlay before overlay uh, itself uh, notify each other. Uh, so from implementation, pro ah, sorry, go ahead. no, no, go ahead, go ahead, Jeff. From go implementation ahead. perspective, uh, or how you would do it in general, uh, you would have Rift bootstrap BFD session. So BFD as a client could have more than one, or as a server could have more than one client. So it doesn't have to go from Rift to EVPN, for example. EVPN or BGP in this case would become client of BFD, and when change comes, EVPN would be notified immediately and at speed. If implementation does it properly, it would happen in forwarding play. Yeah. So you use you use Rift to bootstrap the BFD seamlessly, and then everybody else on the device benefits from it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, Thank so you. that's practically what you will see when you look at an you know, implementation of BFD. But there's nothing new to Rift, right? That you have a BFD session, and the protocol comes up, and it needs BFD, and there is a BFD session already up. It will be shared because that's how BFD works. Yes. So everybody will get a notification from BFD actually failed. Right at the same time, yeah. And then all the Thanks. beauty of EVPN will come in, do mass withdrawal, do peak if you're in such situation. So you're actually benefiting from one protocol seamlessly with up in BFD to converge faster with other higher layers. The, yeah. the, the, the yeah, BFD has a lot of benefits and you know, lots of silicon is coming. That's also why I was pushing it, you know, so, so extensively onto Rift. Uh, there's more interesting discussion about link quality and bring up of link quality you know, and IP fabrics and loss sensitivity and so on, but I'm happy to do another session. And we do it at any resolution because each time I have to explain it a different way, I also you know, learn how to explain it better, I guess. And the questions are always surprising. Yeah. So even the interesting discussion would be maybe with BGP, BGP peak we have, so that uh, data plane uh, implementation, uh, we don't need Rift uh, peak 
for example, right? BGP peak, RIF peak, why we wouldn't need, etc. There are many things that we can uh, discuss. I think uh, RIF requires more attention, and I will try to do that more and more people. Uh, hopefully, we'll watch this, and next time you can send send us questions also for us to discuss if you are interested uh, in data center routing, guys. Uh, give your attention to this video. So, let's uh, finish. Any more? What you guys? Is there a couple of last words? What you want to say? Tony? Oh, nothing from my side, you know. Uh, come to us, download the stuff, starts to play, or with the open source implementation. Um, how you know, proof is in the proof in the pudding, right? How people you can reach it, out to you? How people can reach out to you? LinkedIn, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I'm at PRZ Paparozulu at juniper.net, or otherwise I invite here email and so on. Okay. And simple is PRZ at juniper.net. Yeah. And by the way, both Jeff and I we are using heavily LinkedIn. We talked uh, about that before. So in the uh, video description also you will see the our profile you can add us and uh, connect with us tony are you using social media by the way LinkedIn, I think. Uh, i'm using sorry what? social social media any social media things yeah, yeah, LinkedIn, yeah. Twitter, I, of course I'm, I'm like more than enough connected on linkedin so you can find me there yeah. okay Excellent. the rest i kind of avoid I there's just not enough hours today uh, I, uh, I can proxy to tony i know where he lives so just let me know i'll buy it okay. yeah and he'll bring the dog along i can't resist anything Jeff wants i tell you I'll talk to the guys, by the way, for their availability. And if this video gets a good amount of reaction, so you can like it and you can share your comments. So we will uh, do the second video and we will release it soon. So it depends on your uh, feedback on the video, guys. And thank you very much, Tony and Jeff, for joining. And have a great day. Thank yeah, you. Have a great day. Yeah, perfect.